Okay, well, we'll ask you a few questions shortly, Justin. But um, first of all, we're going to do our, uh, our quiz, our poll. Pick the myth. I will be safe to stay during a bushfire if I have cleared all the vegetation from around my house. I have a house made of brick. I have a bunker. I have a water tank to hide in and a sprinkler system. My house can't protect me, not to hide in, I'll leave that bit out. My house can't protect me from a bushfire, number five. Okay, everyone's going there. My house can't protect me from a bushfire. Oh, we're listening to the Catalyst program. Well, what, what do you think, Justin? What's the answer? Oh, I had trouble answering the really? question. <laughs> <coughs> um, well, in a situation where the fire's bearing down on your house, um, you are pretty much in a situation where your house will protect you from a bushfire because you haven't got a second choice. Um, if you leave the house, you've escalated your risk um, 10 or 20 fold. And um, if you leave your house to hop in a car, you've, um, you're marginally better than um, leaving your house on foot. So um, it's a case of a house, in, in many cases, um, when there isn't adequate warning of an impending fire, is your um, place of protection. Um, and I guess that, that then drives an imperative to um, for the owners of those houses and the occupiers to uh, understand the specific risk they're in and, and take necessary measures um, to, uh, to manage that risk, given, given that there's a fair chance they, they won't have a choice of definitely not being anywhere near the place. Yeah, Kevin. I, I think there needs to be a clear distinction here between uh, a house actively um, protecting you, in a sense, as distinct from uh, using the house uh, for some protection while you're defending the, the property. So a lot of the mistakes that people make will be to think that the house is a safe place. It's not necessarily, but it's probably uh, a lower risk option and providing you've got a whole lot of other things in place, uh, it, it will extend and, and provide you some uh, enough protection to, to actually survive the situation. So we need to get away from the idea that um, uh, a house is going to protect me just in a, without any further work as distinct from a house in combination with a whole lot of other actions and, and uh, uh, options, uh, I have a high chance of surviving. I think we need to actually change that uh, thought process. Drew, I mean, that, that's kind of your area, I guess, that you know, people like to have these sort of simple views of the world. I mean, we all do, you know, that a house is either safe or is not safe. And getting that idea of more complex, spread out risk is across is quite difficult, I imagine. Yeah, I think that's probably true. But I think there's a, a there's a, a more visceral element to this. That is, you will hear the experts talking around it, and they're talking about the house and risk perception, and they have this wonderful socio-technical language that they use about it. It's my bloody house. I live there. My photographs are there. This expectation that if you provide people informed consent and they make the decisions, that they will then be logical, rational beings in my view, and based on a lot of the interview work and stuff, is people make bad decisions in those situations because of their emotional attachment, because of the cultural and symbolic value of the house to them. So I think to develop strategies that assume that the individual is a perfectly rational creature and it's just a lack of information or a lack of technical risk assessment criteria may not actually produce the outcome that we think it is. So I think we have to be very clear in understanding that the emotional, symbolic and cultural value of the house or whatever other piece of property we're talking about. <coughs> I have um, some colleagues that are doing some work in this area at the moment and they're finding one of the biggest drivers of irrational, irrational behaviour is pets. The fact that I've got to protect my horse or my dogs leads people to make the most dumb risk-based decisions. But it's not dumb. That's them thinking about their life and I can't imagine my life without my dog or my horse or my photographs or those kind of things. So I think we have to be really careful and we have to spend a lot of time thinking and understanding how that drives the decision making and trying to deal with making 
or minimising the chance that those factors will distort decision making. The socio-technical experts don't think about that and don't craft their messages in ways so that people aren't necessarily responding in the ways they hope. Okay, what, what struck me when I saw that story the first time it went to air and when I saw it again there was that I also had a perception of embers, you know, floating out of the sky from these fires and, you know, you would stand around the house with your hose and put that one out and put that one out. I mean, that, I guess occasionally that happens, but that sort of firestorm of, you know, like a sandstorm is, is a more common kind of scenario for embers in bushfire? Uh, yes, you, you in fact get both. Uh, both types of behaviours in different stages of the fire, that the, the strafing ember attack is uh, synonymous with the high intensity um, bushfire arrival and once the front's collapsed and the winds break through that fire front, they, they drive a lot of embers in, uh, in and around things, so it, it just embeds itself and carrying with that is actually a lot of debris that's yet to burn, so um, debris will build up um, in places in the gutters and in the crevices where you may have um, diligently uh, uh, cleaned and, and uh, removed things pre, pre-fire event. So Kevin, if you've cleared sort of an area around your house, you know, of 50 metres, so you, how do you fare in a decent old bushfire? Well, I think it's, it's really important to have some, a defendable space somewhere that you can work from So it doesn't guarantee anything, but at least it gives you a chance. I think there are a lot of situations where the fuel right up close to your house is the worst offender, if you like. It's not the forest uh, 50 or 100 metres away that is your major uh, uh, hazard. It's actually some of the fuel around close to the house. So you really need to um, design and maintain your property in a way so that you can have that defendable space. And it's defendable not to necessarily just protect your home, but also to, uh, say, place for you to, to uh, work from, so um, there certainly is a need to, to actually uh, remove some of the, the, the uh, fuels around your house, but you've got to be clear that not all vegetation is necessarily, it wasn't might all burn, it's not all uh, major fuels, so you don't have to actually live in a, uh, a desert uh, in that sort of environment. There are uh, the, the dead components of fuel add more than the, the, a lot of the, the lusher green vegetation, for example. What about a bunker? How useful is that, really? Well, it came up a lot in the uh, Royal Commission, but mm. it, it's it's an option that could be considered, but I guess... Um, it, it is it the solution? It's not the solution, no. Because, uh, A, you've got to get to the bunker. B, the, um, the bu- you have to be able to survive in the bunker for the period of time that the fire is going through. And there, there, There's still lots of ifs and buts about a bunker. I think anyone who uh, puts all their eggs into the, the bunker... You know, that's probably the right thing I'm saying. <laughs> but, <laughs> you've got some sort of food there, though, I imagine. Yeah. Right. But if, you, if your expectation is the bunker is it, then uh, there will almost certainly be a, a problem. It may be that you, your dog's gone astray. It may be that um, um, you've been caught out uh, somewhere away from your, your house. You need another option. So unless you've got multiple options, um, you're really running at a very severe risk of being caught in the fire. Because I guess that, once again, the way humans think, they, it, it, there is a case of, oh, look, I've got a bunker, so everything's OK. Is that... Is that way people may think? Is that a danger of that, that kind of solution? Well, I'll make the, the kind of snide comment that one man's bunker is another man's oven. But um... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's the neighbours who's the oven and not yours. <laughs> Again, I, I think it's... We don't really understand necessarily how people think in panic situations, and particularly in bushfires. I think there's been a lot of work over the last couple of years in looking at emergency evacuation of aeroplanes, and I think there's a lot of valuable stuff that we can learn from that. But what we know in that research is that people panic, and that panic doesn't lead, doesn't matter how good your bushfire plan is. It doesn't matter, things just don't go according to the plan in most cases. So I think there has to be a lot more understanding of the social construction of risk how we actually understand it, how we value our houses, and perhaps sometimes re-educating people to actually have that conversation. Because when they're panicking and it's their fire, just simple things like saying, have you got backups of all of your stuff and your photographs somewhere outside of the bushfire zone? Because sometimes we've heard some amazing stories about people wanting to stay and collect all of their knickknacks or, you know, just really 
strange behaviours at the time that seem irrational, but when you actually think about them in terms of the symbolic and cultural value, they actually make perfect sense. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Justin. I think what I've experienced in sort of um, uh, discussing these things with, with people post bushfire is that the people that had um, really equipped themselves with a sound understanding of bushfire behaviour and the characteristics of bushfire and what it's capable of under different uh, uh, circumstances, and when I say circumstances I really mean weather contexts, um, were the people that uh, were less caught out or, or, or didn't transition into an extreme panic mode and started making a lot of uh, irrational decisions. They, they actually were quite proud of themselves in being able to um, feel comfortable with the phases of the fire moving past and they were on top of the time frames and, and, uh, and of course that's in stark contrast to the next person down the street who w was less equipped um, in the process, so I think that there may be some home truth there. That that um, part of the part of the uh, solution is really getting a, a, a clear understanding of what bushfires can do and what things around them can do under those conditions. But we also know that there can be paradoxical effects. So, for example, somebody can gain a little bit of expertise and knowledge, and we've seen a number of cases where individuals had been offered learnt about it and they were itching to have a go at a fire. That is their traditional original policy was if there's a fire get the hell out of Dodge. That is I'm just getting out of here. Sometimes you might be in a position where you can learn a little bit and you can have a false sense of mastery in the situation. And I'm not saying that's always the case but I'm saying is that these are very complex human behaviours and that sometimes a little bit of knowledge could even end up paradoxically producing a negative outcome and I'm not saying we don't educate and we don't do those things but it's really important that we understand that humans are quite complex non-linear sources of behaviour and many of the people studying this area are quite logical rational physicists and chemists, chemists and people who have very clear logical views of the world. There's a bit of a mismatch sometimes I, and I think we need to understand that much better. No, I think that is a very good point actually. Why don't we um uh, have the next question, I think, the next myth for you guys to see if you can spot, which you're doing pretty well so far, I must say. I don't have to relocate. I've done everything the CFS recommends to prepare my house and property. Um, well, gee, I don't have to really get. Too I've late. done everything. Yeah, too late. Um, <laughs> what did you answer? <laughs> well, I guess so. Yeah, you, you can stay there for the fire. Uh, okay, so um, thirty-five percent agree, twenty-two percent disagree. Well, what do you make of that, Kevin? Well. I guess context is really important here and it's hard to answer that question without the, uh, the context. And I think Drew's just made a good example, I guess, of information or knowledge on its own is, um, is dangerous in the sense that if you haven't got the, the corresponding experience to go with it, um, you're less well equipped. And I guess we, we sort of, um, in our normal operations, if you like, we'll say we don't want people gawking at uh, a fire event, we don't want people interfering with a prescribed burn operation, and yet we want them to be experienced when it comes to a wildfire situation. So you know, maybe there's a, an opportunity there to actually have more community involvement in some of the um, uh, prescribed burns. I can already see that the, the safety and the horror issues <laughs> going on the CFS. <laughs> But, but that's part of the reality. I mean, if we're going to live in this fire prone environment, we need to be more engaged in it. And I think um, that's one of the difficulties with answering a question like this, is it depends very much on your experience as well. What are your thoughts, Justin? Yeah, well, I, I read the question in the way that, uh, well, if, this, if you did everything the CF, CFS recommended and you were prepared, I thought, right, okay, we've got a, a highly diligent um, uh, member of the community. They've done everything possible. They've, they've got their degree in uh, bushfire behaviour. Every, everything's set. <laughs> and, um, and then I thought, gee, um, should they relocate? Well, it's, it's the perfect context question. Um, is this 
how bad is the fire weather? Um, uh, and I was really pleased to see a broad distribution of answers because in fact, um, the point that we tend to try and prepare ourselves or educate actually assumes uh, a, a range of potential fire weathers and fire weather behaviours. And um, as nature um, often reminds us that that's just a range that you can exceed um, uh, quite easily. And um, I guess it's really important to also equip people with an understanding of of when of where in that uh, in that slider you're actually sitting in any given event, so that uh, you have um, you, you have some independent um, drivers and motivators to be able to make a decision about relocation. Do you have anything you want to say? Desperately, Drew, or will I move on to the next one? Oh, only to say that I find it fascinating, and this is a libertarian point of view, is that people want to tell people how to live their lives. And there's a lot that came out of the Bushfire Commission saying, thou shalt. Um, I'm much more of the view that the role of the state and policy is to ensure that people make the most informed decision possible. But ultimately, if somebody chooses to live in a particular area, the state can say, well, we may not be coming to rescue you. you know, that is, you may choose the risk and you, you know, I may choose the risk to live there and say, well, if it's going to be a catastrophic day, I'm just going into Melbourne or Adelaide or something, and I might be quite happy with that risk. So I think there are some really interesting philosophical questions at the political level about the extent to which the state can actually intervene in these decisions and what's actually desirable. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, it's interesting whether the, st whether the state can say, look, you're in a dangerous area, we won't be able to get in and save you and sort of let you go, cut you off. Can the state do that? I can't imagine them doing that. Well, it's... They, they do in, they <laughs> do in America. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily we live in Australia. We, yeah, we better not get further down that line of argument.